Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. We tend to blame our poor health outcomes mainly on our healthcare system. But here in Newfoundland and Labrador, we're quickly learning that social, economic, and environmental factors, which when all considered together are called the social determinants of health, contribute to about 60% of the impact on our health. Where and how we live, work and play, and the inequalities in healthcare access are all key factors in our long-term health outcomes. Our genetic makeup surprisingly only makes up about 15% of our health outcomes, while 25% of the impact is related to our healthcare system. Well, since November 2020, the Health Accord NL has gathered evidence, focused its work into six committees in four working groups, and engaged with thousands of people across the province. It's developed 57 calls to action. The conclusion of this report is that we can address our challenged healthcare system by focusing on these social determinants of health and rebalancing our healthcare system through new approaches that better address our needs. Well, the question remains, what will this rebalanced system look like? How will it be developed, managed, funded, or evaluated? Well, today we welcome back Dr. Patrick Parfrey and Sister Elizabeth Davis to walk us through the findings and the recommendations of the Health Accord NL. This is an important topic that impacts all of us here in Newfoundland and Labrador. So let's check it out. Hi, Sister Elizabeth. Hey, Dr. Parfrey. Welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. So today we're going to go and revisit the Health Accord NL now that you have wrapped up your uh, project. But before we get into some of the findings of the whole project, let's review a little bit for people listening what the Health Accord NL initiative was. Um, First of all, why was it undertaken? Well, it was undertaken at at the request of the Premier and the Minister for Health uh, because there was concern about the fact that our health wasn't as good as the health of people in other provinces and that the performance of our health system wasn't as good as as the other provinces, nor was the health, the performance of the health system in Canada as good as comparable countries in the OECD. Mm -hmm. So we were asked to uh, put together a task force that uh, that had the, the objective of determining what is the best way to improve health over the long term um, and in effect, come up with a plan to transform health. Mm-hmm. That's right. So that's what was one of the objectives was really to look at the health care system and some of the challenges. Uh, Sister Elizabeth, how did those objectives sort of shift as you went through the project? Fairly early on, they shifted quite dramatically, actually, because we realized uh, even before we had the final structures in place to look at the everything, we realized that we needed to be looking at health rather than health care, mm. that we recognize that social, economic, and environmental factors have more influence on our health, 60% probably, than does the health system, which has at best 25% of the impact. So from the beginning, we were not saying health care or health care system. We were saying health, which meant every system, education, justice, municipalities, environment, Every system had to be involved. Mm -hmm. The second thing we realized, and we put it in our very name, that this was not something for Pat and me to do. We had the privilege of facilitating all of it, but it had to be much more inclusive than that. So we carefully chose the members of the task force and the work committees and working groups to be as broadly representative as we could make it, but, you know, with 130 people, that couldn't be too, too representative. We had to, therefore, find ways to engage the public, not to consult with the public or advise the public, but to engage with. And there's, that's where the name Accord came from. Unless everybody was on side, everybody saw the need and everybody saw the pathway to addressing that need, we would have little effect. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, that's an important question. I was wondering how it was structured. And so when you had this very large group of people, you said over 100 individuals, but you did other things as well. You guys did public consultations as part of this to find the issues? We did many, many consultations at many levels. Uh, we, we had six, a series of six public engagements. And what these were, were six times you know, over the course of the uh, study where we invited the public to participate and give us input and at each at the end of each of those series the six series we ourselves made changes 
Uh, we saw things differently. We expanded our horizons. We, we recognized that we have been, even we with our thought, the health accord had been very, somewhat narrow in our thinking. Mm -hmm. So Pat can explain to you then how we structure ourselves within the group so that uh, we could maximize the ways we engage with the public. Mm -hmm. Dr. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I think the key thing for, to, for us is, is that um, the idea of the accord was that that of an agreement between the people and the stakeholders in the political system about the directions to which we had to go to improve health. And the, the report that we submitted uh, with those calls to action had a general consensus of all the people in the task force. Um, and that, that in itself has a substantial amount of strength. And then subsequently, uh, our 10 groups, we had six committees and four working groups, which I'll name in a minute, were then asked to put together what they, how they would implement those directions. And that didn't have the same degree of consensus because we didn't strive for consensus on details because we felt that details would change over time. But we felt that having a blueprint on how to implement these calls to action would be a benefit to decision makers and to the community itself. Mm -hmm. So the areas that we started out in, derived from evidence, were around the social determinants of health, the aging population, uh, which was the oldest in Canada uh, and going to get older, um, the, the, the um, community care system, which was not really fit for purpose at that time and, is, and still not fit for purpose. Uh, the the hospital, hospital system, um, the need for quality and how we would try and get quality in our efforts. And then uh, digital technology as a enabling technology for, for those five strategies, as you might call them. Mm -hmm. And as we were engaging with the public, we discovered that we hadn't got it all right and that we needed to add four working groups and they're in retrospect, when you think of that, they're self-evident, but we didn't. <laughs> we didn't see them as self-evident at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So they, they were around, we, uh, around workplace readiness, uh, workplace uh, provider and public education, uh, financing and the role of uh, intergovernment, particularly with the federal government, uh, and then governance uh, and, and, and the need to be able to have a structure a governance structure that would facilitate the things that we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So in our in both in our report with the cause to action and in our blueprint, that's the basis of that's the anatomy of the presentations. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, so that's that's a tremendous amount of work. You can see why it took such an enormous amount of people to be able to look at this. And I think that just for the sake of the listeners, it might be valuable just to recap some of those health challenges we face, because you said that we have some of the poorest health in the country, but we've got some pretty alarming statistics just on the health outcomes, not the causes. Uh, so maybe uh, Dr. Parfrey or Sister Elizabeth, can you guys walk me through what the what the real health challenges we have here are? Well, I think that the, the basic um, facts that we allowed to speak for themselves was that our life expectancy is over two years shorter than the life expectancy of Canadians. Mm. And that's particularly so for the Indigenous people. It's much shorter. Um, and then the, when you examine the causes of death, which relate to cancer, cardiac disease and stroke, we have the highest death rates in those mm. uh, in the country. And then the, 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 the other piece that we actually didn't know until we got into it was we also had the highest rate of medical complexity amongst children in the country. Mm. Uh, and then on top of that, when you examine the system that was meant to provide care for people, we didn't perform very well, as I mentioned earlier. And we had the highest per capita spending on healthcare. Mm. So the value we were getting from that spending was not very good. And uh, one could think that you could spend the same amount of money and get better outcomes. Yeah. But underpinning all this was the realization that the, the effect on health had far more to do with the social, economic and environmental factors in which we lived than the quality of the health system that we were trying to deliver. We're here with Dr. Patrick Parfrey and Sister Elizabeth Davis, who are sharing the findings from the final report of the Health Accord NL. 
We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. We're here with Dr. Patrick Parfrey and Sister Elizabeth Davis, who are sharing the findings from the final report of the Health Accord NL. Let's get back to the interview. Sister Elizabeth, what were some of the weaknesses that we really saw on that healthcare side of things? And you're right that it was, so it's around health, not health care, and it's around health outcomes, not inputs. And it's also around health equity. As mm. Pat said, there's a difference among us in our health status, depending on what group we're born into, where we live in the province, what age we are. And so these things had to be addressed. We were very conscious of our population in this province. It's we now have gone from in my lifetime having the youngest population in Canada to having the oldest population in Canada. Uh, for example, when I was a teacher in the 1970s, we had 200,000 children under the age of 15. Today we have 70,000. In those early 70s, we had 30,000 people over the age of 65. Today, we have 120,000 people over the age of 65. The good news is there's more older people. The bad news is there are fewer younger people. Mm -hmm. And that was partly a result and significantly probably a result of the out-migration because of the COD moratorium in the 1990s. We lost 12% of our population in 10 years, which is almost unheard of in a, in a place like ours. But that wasn't even across the province. There were parts of this province lost 75% of their children, uh -huh. 75%. Uh -huh. So you can only imagine the impact on an area that lost that many children and where their future will be. But also, what are their health needs? It's no longer responding to young people with acute illness. Now you're responding to older people with both chronic illness. Uh -huh. We also, again, somewhat new to our thinking, was realizing that one of the major impacts on health, probably right now the most significant, is poverty levels. And how do we address poverty in a systemic way without stereotyping people who are living below the poverty line? And that was a major uh, learning for us in terms of how we deal that we, you would think with a universal health care system it shouldn't matter if you're rich or poor that matters hugely yeah yeah and then the new kid on the block in our awareness i suppose is climate change you know these days in on the island of newfoundland we're experiencing very warm weather and we think it's wonderful that wonder is going to quickly diminish the, the rising temperature in Labrador, it could be as high as 13 degrees Celsius over the next 30 years, means that the traditional fishing and hunting patterns of the Inu and the Inuit are all really quite disturbed. Mm -hmm. They themselves spoke to us about that. Mm -hmm. the people on the island don't have the same awareness. So we are not going to change climate but how do we accommodate for that? How do we recognize its impact? Mm -hmm. Perhaps for Pat and me, the most tragic of all that the under new awarenesses is the amount of exclusion there is still among us, so the amount of stereotyping, how we exclude people who don't look like me. And you know, we're a province that holds ourselves out to be so welcoming and hospitable, and we are the strangers, but not so much to each other. Many we it was so it was so significant that over a period of two months we met with many many groups, helping us better understand that how do we recognize exclusion social exclusion is a determinant of health and how do we address that? So you're right, a health system can't do that. A healthcare system, there you need all the other systems working very closely together. And without the silos, if we heard one word repeated over and over again, it was the word silo mm -hmm. between the health system and the education system, between municipalities and the health system, between, you know, just everywhere we looked, we, we saw these silos that were systemic problems to addressing a very integrated issue in terms of improving health, health outcomes and health equity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I might add, Mike, just sure. one thing that I've examined recently is the census. 
and the census changes from 2016 to 2021. The data has only just come out this year, and uh, that the, the, it's 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 a concern because our population continues to drop, particularly in rural areas. And the change in the population in the South Coast, for example, in five years has been 10%. Mm -hmm. Right. So this, this, this is striking, right? I mean, Sister yeah. talked about it being unprecedented to lose 12% of your population after the COD moratorium. We don't have any COD moratorium now. And uh, th this regional um, loss of people is a major concern because it does affect the services that you're able to provide to groups of people. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. Okay. So a couple of things you just said there, like, you know, rural shrinking. I was actually in Labrador this year in Nain going out on the ice with uh, the, the communities up there learning about their way of life and it is affecting them. They've got to have ice sensors to make sure they're safe while they're using their highway system, which was startling. And the other thing that really sh uh, shook me about climate change was, um, Talk about food sustainability. If the rest of the world that produces the food is having challenges with climate change, that affects us and the cost of our food. And so when you talk about this still continuing level of out migration, how is the economy of the province impacting this? Is this why people are leaving? Is this why it's there's such a, a poverty barrier when it comes to our population? And that's what we saw very early, that you can't have economic development first and expect to address the health challenges second, mm -hmm. nor can you address the health challenges first and worry about the economy second. They're integrated. Mm -hmm. We have to look at both together with, a, again, an integrated approach so that, that we're, we're always seeing that this is holistic. This is not something we can do piecemeal. Mm -hmm. And that's been one of the most significant things about our messaging around the health report, it's, uh, uh, health accord itself, is that you can't take a piece here and a piece there, or what looks timely here, or what is something we should address there. The calls to action might be implemented in different ways, but if you don't take that overall approach that's integrated, you're going to make zero difference in the outcomes at the end. And the and it's a zero dis, dis difference, but not a zero some zero gain. It's not if you do nothing, it'll stay the way it is. As Pat said, the shock of knowing in the past five years, parts of this province were losing the population for or that we lost over 30 years initially. So we doing nothing means you lose ground. So not only will our health system get weaker, but the health of the people will get weaker and the health inequity will grow. Mm -hmm. And so having that holistic approach is hard in today's world where everything is so instant. Yeah. I want an answer now, you know, I text you we, in so many characters, right? We're a very instant world that quickly loses our attention on even the most serious issue. Look at the war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that was uppermost in the news. Now it's hardly in the news at all. And that war is getting worse. Not that it's got better, and therefore we're able to worry less about it. But, you know, we have such short attention spans as a mm -hmm. society now. So to address something like that in the manner we're asking for here is quite challenging. To be persistent, as Pat always says, it's not easily done. Yeah, it's such a it's such a a, a, a a change from the way things have been done, and I think you guys can both attest to this with your backgrounds. Is that health isn't valued until it's lost. A lot of people don't put that as a priority as being important to their lives until they need it or their health deteriorates. And when I think about health awareness and what's happened right in the middle of your entire project, we got burdened with COVID nineteen. You know, did the pandemic shed light on any of the challenges we have in our healthcare system as part of this? Uh, process? I certainly did. Um, <laughs> from a practical perspective, it meant we did everything by Zoom, mm -hmm. which, which was actually a, a very efficient. Okay. And we were able to get, get, get uh, um, connected to multiple different groups efficiently. Um, but it also gave us lessons in terms of what virtual care could be like. Mm. Um, and when you, when you look at the, the demographic change that's occurring uh, out of rural communities, the old model of one doctor and a, or a doctor and a hospital um, is no longer tenable. 
the population has changed from being young to being old. Um, frail, being frail requires a different set of skills to try and to help the people who are frail. Mm-hmm. Um, so the need for what we call community teams, but it's it's people working together across different uh, um, uh, provider groups, um, providing care to a, a population group seems to me that it has to happen. Um, and it has to be far more holistic in terms of integrating uh, elder care and mental health and public health and traditional primary care and children at risk, etc. cetera. So um, a lot of that was brought home to us as we were going through these Zoom meetings. We're here with Dr. Patrick Parfrey and Sister Elizabeth Davis, who are sharing the findings from the final report of the Health Accord NL. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. We're here with Dr. Patrick Parfrey and Sister Elizabeth Davis, who are sharing the findings from the final report of the Health Accord NL. Let's get back to the interview. What were some of the findings you think are most relevant to our listeners to, to understand, you know, where do we need to focus our efforts? Well, I think we're back to our holistic approach here. Mm. We can not choose one or two that we think are better areas to look at or more pertinent to me. Um, we have to look at all of and we have to have the leadership to look at all of them. And that leadership resides, of course, first and foremost in the ones who commissioned the report, mm-hmm. which is the government of the day. The municipalities have key roles here. The leaders of all our systems have key roles and the public has a key role. So one of the things that will underpin all of this is our accountability for doing something here. We can choose to make a change. We can choose to reduce poverty. We can choose to be more inclusive, but it is a choice. So we do have the tools today that we didn't have 30 years ago when I was in the system to measure outcomes and to report on them. But we have to do that measurement and that reporting in a way that's understandable to people. So that's part of what we're recommending here. Many provinces have health councils. We don't. We need one. But this health council will be different than others in two ways. One, it won't just measure health, what we normally measure with the health system, Mm. the biology, if you will, but it will measure these other areas that we talked about. Mm. And secondly, and perhaps even more importantly, it will report not to the premier or the minister, but to the House of Assembly, to the people. Mm-hmm. And therefore, how it reports will have to be in ways that ordinary people can understand and therefore hold us accountable to us, all of us, not just government. Mm-hmm. So that's one major piece that is easy to forget because it's a kind of a foundational piece. But coming back then to the various areas around the social determinants of health, we believe we have to have a major approach to reducing poverty. We began a poverty reduction strategy um, almost over 10 years ago in this province that started well, but kind of faded. We need to bring that back in a very robust way. We're recommending actually that we have a guaranteed basic income. And, uh, but that can't be done by the province alone because it's quite expensive, at least initially, the outcomes would offset the expenses. Uh, We could be do it on our own with the federal government's partnership with the federal government as a pilot. Maybe we could do a pilot in Atlantic Canada. So so that is the one hope that um, a major concern, but we also, because that will take some while to implement, we have to improve our uh, income, how we do income support. We have to improve how we um, uh, make sure that our social, the social accounting that we do is done in a way that's indexed and not just uh, set in time, if you will. We talked about a pathway to inclusion. Earlier we mentioned that uh, uh, exclusion is one of the things, that, the hard, hard things we learned about the problems. So I, I did just just following through on Sister Elizabeth's comment there is that uh, the the reality is is that in the last uh, thirty years we've had flat social spending last forty years and uh, we've had an increase of two hundred thirty two percent in 
medical and healthcare spending. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really an inverse of what it should really be. Um, so the one of the questions is then is that how do you increase that social spending and how do you target it to get better outcomes? Mm-hmm. And the reality is that we're actually further behind from a, 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 a measurement perspective or an evaluation perspective on the social side than we are on the health side. And the, the, we, we really think that we have to get our capacity to measure various things. And there, there's a lot of information collected on education and on housing and on income, et cetera, but it's not integrated. Mm-hmm. It's not integrated with the health system. And to be honest, if you want to target um, spending and social things to be able to benefit the most victimized groups, then you need to know who they are, where they are, and what you're going to do for them. Mm-hmm. So the, from, from our perspective, that's a kind of a, an early thing that's necessary. Whereas on the medical system side, we don't have the same problem. We've got what the problem there is we've got more data, you can, it's, you know, to shake a stick at. It's just oodles and oodles of data, and it's making sense of it uh, is the key piece and really to create a system that uses that information to for to to have better practice and we're calling it a learning health and social system Mm. not an accountability system and learning health and social system where we use information on the most important things that are are, uh, the most important outcomes we're interested in and then say are we matching up with what we can do best and then changing Mm. as a result of the information and that's the measurement of quality that we're interested in. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the stuff that we need to do in, on the health side is from, from the perspective of the health accord is probably more uh, defined. We need to have community teams to deliver care in the community. Uh, we need to have uh, an approach to the frail elderly that's better than what we got. We need a integrated, unfragmented, provincial air and ground ambulance system that's able to provide more efficient care for critical care and for urgent care. Uh, and we need a health information and, and virtual care system. It, and, and I suppose I'd add to that, we need a better child health model. Mm-hmm. So it's feasible for us to provide priorities that we need to act, to deal with uh, in the first year. Whereas on the social side, there's, to my way of thinking, there's far more need for integration of information and know what's happening in the province um, before we can really target what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think about healthcare all the time and that you're, there's leading indicators that we might not even know about because like you said, the, the health status is typically dictated by these social determinants of health. And to me, it almost sounds like we're migrating from a sick care system to a healthcare system when it comes to sort of this new approach towards it. And I think that's uh, really important when it comes to the social spending thing, that people understand that, that these programs that are in the community will keep people in better care so they don't end up having to avail of the healthcare system at all. Um, I, I, can we just quickly visit that team's approach? Because I love that. I'm a wellness background myself and integrating different disciplines together to take care of people with more complex health issues is extremely interesting because it's not just about doctors and nurses right now, is it? No, it's, uh, well, it hasn't been about just doctors and nurses for some time. Mm-hmm. But, and we've held for some time the belief that we have to have health professionals working in teams. But we have never structured ourselves to make that happen, in, except in small pockets here and there. It hasn't been right across the whole spectrum. And the one area where it's worked least effectively in is in the community health care side. So we're recommending across the whole province that we have community teams. The team would include family physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, physios, OTs, social workers, paramedics, mental health workers, elder care workers, and that they would cover an area of at least six to 7,000 people and higher in places like St. John's that they would not work from the same building or even from the same community, but that they would be connected virtually one with the other. And they would be have an accountability for everybody in their area, not just the people who come to their doors with a problem, but that we have rostered, people would be rostered into these community teams. Uh, Of course, people's choice, but 
by and large, that's what would happen. So if I'm older, I have chronic conditions, but pretty much much in balance right now in my community, living alone. I'm not going to, I don't need to see the doctor or the nurse or the social worker right now, but they know that I'm there and they're keeping a watchful eye for me so that when I, they're able to prevent things before they happen, if you will. So that's one model of community teams that we feel strongly about. And we think we need between 35 and 40 to blanket the whole province. We see in long-term care, the challenge right now in long-term care, it's primarily the nursing groups and the physicians, but we really need to bring into long-term care many of these other specialists as mm -hmm. well, physios, OTs, speech pathologists, audiologists. We also, though, see that as even broader than just the health system, so that the community team has to work very closely with the school teams or the municipal governance teams so that we have to integrate across the systems as well as, as within. Pat used the example of children. If it, we have more higher level medical complexity than other parts of the country for children, young children. Up till now, there's been really a siloed approach between the healthcare system and the education system. They haven't even shared information and the way that they need to. So that those two teams remain with their individual accountability, but they have to work closely with each other. Mm -hmm. At the other end of the spectrum, we have to care for frail elderly when they come to the health of the hospital. But we also have to move back before that and have age-friendly communities. So we have to design our communities in a way that support people, more and more of us who are older and frailer with chronic conditions, but living still healthy lives. So how can we support that in a community? Mm -hmm. Everything from how arts, is, arts were, arts to uh, transportation, to housing, to shopping, to all of that. How do we support that? And there's good modeling for that. Mm. From the World Health Organization from, uh, you know, there's lots, we have lots of ideas out there, but we have to work together and that back to your team concept. We're here with Dr. Patrick Parfrey and Sister Elizabeth Davis, who are sharing the findings from the final report of the Health Accord NL. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. We're here with Dr. Patrick Parfrey and Sister Elizabeth Davis, who are sharing the findings from the final report of the Health Accord NL. Let's get back to the interview. What role, you know, if we're looking at bringing everybody together, education, health, community, um, what role does industry and, and workplaces play and uh, being able to promote health to prevent people from getting sick? Well, it's not only industry and uh, it's municipalities. It is the health system. Mm -hmm. we, we, we are, I mean, we work in the health system. The biggest employer in the province, 20,000 people work in the health system. So the, the whole idea that, I mean, I've been thinking about this kind of deeply, is this, how do you, how do you try and retain providers in a, in a, in a society is losing population and a quarter of them are elderly and there's not the source of workers within the community in the within the province to provide all the all the uh, providers that are necessary so i clearly immigration is a piece of it but there's also another piece of it is that as we transition to these better structures that are you know that provide a better work life balance and uh, a happier workplace and a more effective workplace we're going to have to transition in innovative manners in a way that allows us to allows us to believe that everybody in the province does have access to care. So that requires these this these transitioning approaches to really get behind virtual care, get behind hub and spoke care, where there might be one hub with more doctors providing care to a spoke that has no doctors, mm -hmm. and that we we do have to. Um, be far more innovative um, in what we're trying to do as we transition to these better team-based structures. So that's a really tremendous background on the project and, and the findings. I guess the question that remains is what's next? What should we expect to see as a population as we start to integrate the findings of this project? 
So we, we've, we've said previously that the um, uh, demonstration that the government is serious about uh, following going down these uh, um, directions uh, would be the structure that they put in place. Um, and uh, we've suggested that uh, or recommended that there be a, an interim CEO um, of a provincial health authority to plan the, uh, the, the new governance system. Um, who would be advised by, by, by public representatives um, that there would be a senior executive in cabinet secretariat to influence and advocate for the content of the health accord, that there'd be a, an advisory council on health as a follow-up or, or a continuation of the task force, um, and that there'd be an interim council on health quality and performance so that the basic information that's necessary around how you evaluate the health accord, um, how you integrate various records so that you get a better approach to um, the various things that the health accord is recommending. Um, and one of those things would be, how do you get basic information about children, um, integrating social determinants of health and, and, and uh, health, health stuff. Um, so that, that council would be involved in doing that. And it would also start off that learning health and health and social system that I was talking about uh, to you earlier. Um, and uh, so far, the government has moved on the first two, and I'm optimistic they'll move on the second two. Um, uh, it, it would be unreasonable for the government to expect the governor to come out and say, well, we accept everything you've said in the blueprint, because they couldn't. They're the decision makers. they got to balance cost and... Uh, effect and all the rest of it but they can look at what we're recommending and determine what what they can do and what they can't do and uh, because they, there has been agreement that the 59 directions that we want to go to the action that we want to take that they should be followed yeah that's right that's right and so uh you know forward thinking if we integrate this uh, these these insights and we make these changes what do we expect to be the outcome in the future for the, for the healthcare system of our province? Um, with the, in two other structural pieces first that we hope will begin to emerge. One is we're talking about a provincial health authority because we have to have that integrated approach. We're only a half million people, not enough to have diverse myriad approaches. So, but, but at the same time, even though we're only a half million people, we're spread over an inter very interesting geography that's very diverse from Nain to Port of Basque to Ramia, to St. Downtown, St. John's. So we're recommending that provincial health authority have the overall oversight and responsibility for the system, but they also have in place four or five regional health councils whose work would be to provide the care in their area. They know best their local area. So they provide the programs, community teams, the hospitals, the health centers, the connections with the other systems. So we're very strong on that. Uh -huh. The second piece that we think will be very important for this, because it's, it's not going to be hard to keep looking at the health system because mm. that's right in people's faces and we're all quite worried about it. As you said, when our health fails is when we're most attentive. But we need another set of structures that will help us somehow keep our eye on the social, environmental, economic factors. So we're recommending at the regional levels there be also regional health and social networks that will help an area come together to focus on what's important in their area. So let's say you live on the Bonavista Peninsula or the Buren Peninsula or the Great Northern Peninsula. So your area has needs the same as the rest of the province, but it has some unique pieces to it. So in your area, we're saying that we want to bring together the leaders in the health system, the leaders in the justice system, the leaders in the education system, the mayors and, and town council people, the, the people who work in social services, all coming together to say, what is the highest health need right now in our area? Mm -hmm. They won't have the authority to make anything happen, but they, what they will have the right to do is go back to their parent organization and say, we need to do this differently, 
or we need to create a liaison in this case between the mental health system and the child health system, the mm-hmm. education system, whatever the particular priorities they set. Mm-hmm. So these networks are very important, we believe. We think we advised from the health accord itself that within the first five years, the plan be implemented. As Pat said, how will change based on other kinds of realities, but that the implementation happened should be a five-year plan. However, it's going to take us 10 years. That's why we have always talked about that 10-year transformation of health. Mm -hmm. That it will take us 10 years to see the fruits of the work that we put in here. So we have to be very persistent and keep focused on that ultimate vision, which is health, improved health, health outcomes, and health equity. And as Pat said, we have to keep measuring how we're doing along that pathway, changing where it's not working, but reporting in a way, evaluating the reporting of the evaluation in a way that all of us can understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a continuous improvement would be super important. Go ahead, Dr. Perfect. I was just going to say, Mike, that the um, the biggest um, uh, thing that's going to happen is in the next number of years, besides climate change, is going to be the aging of the population. Mm-hmm. And uh, if we do not become more innovative in the way that we um, care for the frail elderly, we will definitely not be able to afford a health system. Uh, so we, we have to go to geriatrics informed approach to care and uh, away from a medical model of care for people who are frail elderly. And if that doesn't, that has to start soon. It can't be left go for another 10 years because our budget, our, our provincial budget will be subsumed by health. Right, yeah. because it's driven by the fact that we're all getting older. Yeah, yes. And I mean, these are such relevant topics for us in our future here in this province. So I really appreciate you both for coming on and giving me updates throughout the whole project. And also thank you to you and your countless team members that have made this happen. Such a huge undertaking, but of paramount importance to us. So thanks for joining me today. Thank you, thank you Mike. Thank you to Dr. Patrick Parfrey and Sister Elizabeth Davis for joining us today. As they indicated, our province is facing a significant challenge when it comes to our health. We have the oldest population in the country, and we have the worst healthcare outcomes per dollar invested in Canada. We lead the nation in many preventable diseases, and all of this together may seem insurmountable. But it actually offers us an opportunity to take a closer look at what's working and what isn't. And that's exactly what the Health Accord NL has accomplished. I have several colleagues who participated in the project, and there are thousands of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians who have also contributed. I personally look forward to the next steps as we look to the future, one that is healthier and more equitable for our communities. Well, that's our show this week. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. We'll see you back here next week for another episode of The Wall Show on your VOCM.